Remember the excitement you felt when you moved to the new house, the new opportunities that would open up, and all the new friends that you would make, and the new places that you get to be in. My family moved to this really old town in Arkansas in 2004. I guess my family was down on money, and this town somehow was the savior for my father, as he inherited my aunt's property. All of it, and there was a big house that he inherited too. So when we moved, we moved to that house, and it was more like mansion. Now, it wasn't a new house, it was built at least a century ago, but to us, it was our new house. The new house in Arkansas, as I recall this adventure, I was someone who was born in the fast-paced New York, and then the shift brought me to such a drastic halt that it was unbearable for me in the beginning. I was a city boy, and I was suddenly in a place that was slower than what I had been used to. So finding a balance was something that was important to me. My school was from a bike distance, and I didn't know anyone there, so going there on my own was something I wasn't into. As I got to the place, I saw kids turning their heads and looking at me, and probably judging as to who this new kid was. It was almost as if everyone knew everyone there, and I was someone new, and obviously some thought it might be best to try and bully the new kid. Well, I might have been from a city, but I wasn't one of those soft city boys that cannot defend themselves. A tall student probably held back, moved closer and said, Hey new kid, got any lunch money? And I said, I have lunch money, but it's not for you. He was big, and certainly it seemed that my comment made him angry. He tried grabbing me, and I held his hand, and punched him right in the gut. I must have been smaller than him, but there was no way he was going to get it up on me. It was his mistake to underestimate me, but then the whole class had the idea that I wasn't the guy to be messed with. My first impression at that school was that I am not the one to be messed with. It was the first day, and I was in detention. They told me to call my parents, but since they were not really back, so I had to stay back at the school. While coming back from the detention, I saw one of the guys had gathered around the backyard where my bike was parked, and it was the same guy I beat the crap out of. He was out there with his friends, and from what I know, he was probably there for beating me. He and his boys were waiting to just bash me. I saw it from the distance, and I was pretty sure that I wasn't going to involve in that. I was tough, but I wasn't going to mess up with so many people. They would mess me up. So I stayed down knowing that it was best for me, and it was definitely not wise to mess with four people. I tried circling back, and they thought, but they made me when I was trying to sneak and decided to follow. I saw one of them. They had the knife in his hand, and it was really something different. I guess people here were really off the chart. The psychos of the school were after me with the knife in his hand. I bet all he could think was stab me real good. I was making sure that it didn't happen, so I was pedaling as fast as I could. I wasn't going to stop. I decided to keep moving, and I kept moving knowing that these kids would not stop hunting me. I soon was in the front of my new house, and I quickly opened it up and got inside. There was no one in there, and I had to wait hoping that someone would arrive, but I don't think anyone was arriving. I locked the door and shut myself in but the bastards knew where I live now, and there was this feeling that they will not let go. It turns out they didn't. Next morning, when I was getting ready for the school, they stood out of my house on their bikes, and they signaled me as they passed by my house. Somehow that day I stayed at home, but I knew I had to get on with it someday. So as I got out of my door knowing what is coming, I set out to go to the market in the evening, and I already had a plan in action. I saw that they were all standing right outside my house, and I knew it was my time to get beat up, but instead I invited them in. If there was a way to avoid the beating, it was by my plan. I invited them in, and they expected, and the guy said, This doesn't mean you are not going to get beat up. We'll just do it inside. I knew what I was doing. I brought them in, knowing what is in store for them. It was they had no idea what they were getting involved in and I made sure that they never would. They entered, and the first thing they saw was a hand just lying there with blood coming out of the corner. They were freaked, but they were not completely aware of what I had set them up for. 
and soon there was another hand, and some fingers of a different hand just lying on the floor. The whole house was giving them the creepy vibes, and then a man came out running with a hand on his throat, and what looked like blood was oozing out of the veins of his neck, and he screamed, help me, help me, and he ran out the door, freaking every single one of those boys. And then I said, what do you guys want to talk about? And as I asked this, I took one of the fingers and started using it as a tool to clear my eye, and I bet they were spooked, since nobody said anything. They just ran as far and as fast as they could. I kept all of my mother's film prosthetics away, and then along with Ramirez, the guy who acted out the slit throat, cleared the mess. I messed up those guys good, but good thing is, through time, I have formed a friendship with everyone. And when the first day I told them the story of how I fooled them, they were all embarrassed, but most importantly, it helped me be friends. Now I am quite fond of the people of my small, irrelevant town. My name is Jack, and right now I'm 26 years old. This happened when I was 15. My mom was out of town at the time and my dad had let me and a couple of friends to come over and watch the World Cup start in 2010. It had been a while since we watched football at all, so we were all very excited. We got some pizza and some snacks and started to watch. Around halftime, we heard some scratching at the window. We all shook it off as the wind since we lived in a gated community, and it was a very safe neighborhood. After the game, we started to watch a movie, and that was when things started to get out of control. We heard the sound again, only this time it was louder. My friend, let's call her Maya, got a bit freaked out and grabbed a baseball bat. My other friends, let's call them James, Alan, and Steve, thought she was losing it, but at that point I was getting a bit suspicious too. So I turned on the security cameras on a smaller TV. Everything seemed okay, until we heard the noise again. We looked at the camera, but nothing was there. So we called my dad, and he looked out the window. There was nothing there, so he said to calm down and watch the movie peacefully. We forgot about it for a while, until about 40 minutes later, when we went upstairs to grab more snacks. Our house was pretty big, and I felt the need to check every room, but I convinced myself that it was okay. We went downstairs again to resume the movie, and I decided to look at the security camera, and I nearly screamed. There was a man in a tattered lay Dodgers shirt and sweatpants, standing with a butcher knife in his hand at the living room window. He had a deranged look on his face, and his long, dirty, matted black hair made the situation even scarier. I motioned to my friends, and James almost screamed, but covered his mouth to prevent that. And before we could do anything, he went to the door and pounded on it, and said in a deep voice, open up, open up. Maya and I both grabbed our baseball bats again, but we were both shaking like crazy. I was pissed off and scared. We all slowly went upstairs to check to see if the doors were all locked. Who the hell was this guy, and what the hell did he want? My dad at that point had heard the noise, and had to come down from upstairs, and he took one look at the guy, and nearly fainted. He yelled at him to leave, or he will call the cops. I had never seen my dad so angry. James, who was the youngest, was reasonably terrified. So he was hiding behind a couch, and Alan was just pale and frozen, while Steve had his fist clenched and had a deathly scared look on his face. The guy had the creepiest grin you could ever see in your life. He seemed like he was on drugs. I really didn't know what to do until he yelled. He started stabbing the door, that's when I finally snapped back and yelled at him to leave, or I will kill him myself. I really don't know why I said that, and I wish I didn't, because he looked at me and ran towards the window, and shattered it with his shoulder. My dad, meanwhile, was calling the cops, and went to get spare knives from the kitchen while Maya and I were the only ones armed at that point. The guy was already in our house, so I screamed. Both me and Maya charged at him. This was just us teens being reckless, but we managed to drop him. 
The man got up and held the knife and said, Don't think about it. I didn't know what to do, but I was pissed. So I hit his hand with the bat as hard as I could. I don't think I hurt him even a bit, but I managed to drop the knife out of his hands. That brought us some time. As he bent down to pick it up, Maya's hands were still shaking, so when she swung the bat, she missed. As the guy was about to pick the knife up again, my dad ran full speed out of the kitchen and rammed into him. With a hit, he dropped his knife again. The creepy guy was winded for a moment, as my dad pinned him as best as he could, but the guy somehow got out. By that time, both Maya and I had come to our senses and swung at the same time. My blow got his back, which I'm sure must have hurt a lot, and Maya, who was still shaking, somehow managed a solid blow to his crotch. The guy doubled back and cursed in pain, and this time my dad wrestled him to the floor with Steve's help and put him in a chokehold. But unfortunately, the guy kicked my dad's stomach, grabbed his knife, and threw it where my friends and I were standing. Most of us got out of the way, but Steve wasn't so lucky as it grazed his leg. It wasn't serious, but it definitely hurt as he yelled out in pain. At this point, the guy was running at us again, but this time, he wasn't as lucky. He had only faced one or two of us at the time, and he escaped because of our pure shock to the situation. I got him first and punched him in the throat. Steve got there next and kicked him in the shin, and finally my dad and Alan wrestled him to the floor and finally subdued him. Steve was understandably pissed and kicking the guy while he was pinned down. The guy kept saying stop, but my dad covered his mouth and he couldn't talk. The cops arrived about 10 minutes later and arrested the guy. At that point, the commotions awoke the neighbors, so the whole neighborhood was outside at that point, wondering what the hell was going on. The guy tried to resist the police, and we can all guess how that ended up working out for him. He got taste, and they put him in the car and drove off. We later learned that the guy was a known criminal and was on the police's radar. He was probably a pedophile as well. As I said in the beginning of my story, I am 26, and I am still close with those friends. Most of us turned out fine, but Steve had to go to a therapist for a while. He had night terrors because of that knife throw, but he's okay now. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't turned on the security cameras, and I am so thankful I did, because I might not have been able to tell this story now. This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me as no one ever used that door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time, and all of the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't make sense to me to use the back entrance, and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door, I saw two tall men in the window standing at the door. A chill went down my spine. I didn't feel safe opening the door, so I called out hello. One of the men tapped on the window. Yes, hello. May we come in? We're with Bresnan. At the time my husband and I had Bresnan for cable, but did not have any issues with it, and I replied, We're not having any issues with Bresnan. Is there a problem? Man, the man said, Can we come in? We're servicing the area, and it's important we look at your cable. I shook my head. We're not having any issues, I repeated, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we're visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the doorknob and tried to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey shakiness in my voice, so you don't need to be here. The two figures appeared to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline and need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work, and I gripped the knife tighter. Mom, mom. I saw him try the doorknob again. I closed my eyes 
and felt overwhelming gratitude of always locking my doors. And just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Could I please get your names and badge numbers? I can give your supervisor a call and let them know our cable is fine. I heard another shuffle, and one of the men replied, No need to, ma'am. We're sorry we wasted your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't hold my phone. With the knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of my other hand, I just sank to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he came home. He immediately called the Bresnan Cable Company and spoke to a representative who informed us that no one from their company was out on an assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company, and no one had.